Thank you so much for inviting me to Maryland. When was the last time I was here? My, that was a long time ago. I think it was back in 2006, the last GYC that took place here in Maryland. Baltimore, Baltimore. Well, it's nice to be in the state of Maryland. I don't know why they call it Maryland. Do you? A land that belongs to Mary? Yeah? And why is it the below state in Virginia? Virgin Mary belongs to... I don't know. I have no idea. But it's nice to be here. The land of freedom. Amen? And um, it is so nice to see many uh, Asians I feel at home. But of course, we include Caucasians. They're part of us as well. At the end, we're all Asians. Amen? All right. So, this weekend, we are going to study the Bible together. You know, my job is not to create followers. My job is not to make myself known. My job is really, really simple. I just want to deliver God's message. You want to be more spiritual, yes? Isn't that true? Yeah. Do you know what it feels like to be more spiritual? What happens? Do you suddenly have more spiritual power and strength? What does it mean to have more spirituality? I believe when we are becoming more spiritual, we are going to have more inner peace. What do you say? And I believe that we are going to have more inner courage. At the same time, we are going to have greater understanding and knowledge. What do you say? Now, all of these things can happen if our spirituality can grow. But how can it grow, my friends? The answer is always been the same. That answer is more clear understanding of God's Word. That's one. And number two, our decision, our will, our acceptance, our embracement to the understanding of God's Word. Then we can turn into hot Christians. What are you saying? Yep, that's it. Let's make it really, really simple. And um, let's begin with a prayer because we need God's help. So join me as I pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we come before you with humble spirit and confessing that we are nothing, we don't know anything, we need your help tonight as we open the Bible. May the Holy Spirit speak to us in a most special way that our eyes can be opened, our hearts can become humble to embrace your truth. We thank you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. So what I like to do, I like to give you, in the beginning, more an intellectual, academical understanding of the teachings of Jesus first. And then we are going to apply that personally and more spiritually, okay? At the end of my presentation, I want you to understand what it means to be hot. What it means to be more spiritual. You know, 
I am so spiritual because I attend church every Sabbath. No. I'm so spiritual because I just came back from a mission trip. Maybe. I'm so spiritual because I read my Bible and I pray every day. Maybe. So let's find out. If you, if we are truly spiritual. Now I know there is strong connection be- between you are a religious person and you are a spiritual person. Strong connection. However, you can be ceremonially religious, but you may not be spiritual. Let's find out about that. Now, first of all, let me sell you Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. What do I mean by selling it to you? I want to sell it to you so well so that at the end of my presentation, you cannot wait to go home and read Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Because this becomes so powerful. Now, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, do you have one of these Bibles uh, where you have the words of Jesus in red? Okay. Can you see how much red you have in 5, 6, and 7? How much? All, pretty much all, right? All three chapters. Now, do you know any other chapters in the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that you can see like three chapters completely covered in red? Why do you look at me? Think. Where? Where else? Maybe John chapter 14, 15, 16, and 17 comes pretty close. Yeah. Anywhere else? Maybe Matthew chapter 24 and 25. What am I trying to say is this. There are not that many places where you can find words of Jesus completely covered, and that's all we see and read. You with me? Now listen. Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is, is what we call the Mount, Sermon on the Mount, yes? And this sermon, it is as though Jesus, his message, based on why he came to this earth. Meaning, he came to this earth to give this message. So it is really short, but very important. There are many other places we, we see Jesus talking, but many times it's based on someone asking Jesus dumb questions. This coin, who should we give this coin to? Uh, this woman had, a fi- uh, had a five husbands, and they all died. When she go to heaven, which one would be her husband? Dumb questions. Do you understand? Why, uh, why is it that your, your disciples, they, um, they don't wash their hands? And then Jesus has to explain. So there are many places in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus has to do the explanation to these uh, religious leaders and uh, scribes and the priests and the Levites who went to theological schools. So Jesus had to go through a lot of explanation. Now, so, so it's like, like Matthew 5, 6, and 7, it's like Jesus had this ample time to say what he wants to say. Are you with me? It's almost like, hey, scribes, Pharisees, uh, Levites, and, and, and all of you Sadducees, please be quiet. Don't ask him any more questions. Just let this guy speak. Go ahead, Jesus, speak to us. Are you with me? So Jesus, as he had the attention of thousands of audience, the very first thing that came out of his mouth, Matthew 5. Yes, I'm getting old. I'm wearing glasses. Matthew 5 and verse 2. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, 
Bless are the poor in spirit, for there is a kingdom of heaven. Bless are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Bless are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Bless are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Bless are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Bless are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Bless are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Bless are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for there is a kingdom of heaven. Bless are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. We heard these words before, yes? And uh, when you hear those words, how do you feel? Do you feel blessed when you hear those words? When you hear those words, you feel like, oh, that's what Christianity is all about. Christianity is all about um, having poor in spirit, mourn, be meek, hunger, thirst, be merciful, have pure heart, be a peacemaker, and get persecuted at the end. That's a Christian life. Okay, if you, if you have all of these things, you are truly, truly blessed. Yes? I want to show you how these words are fundamental basis for all his teachings especially in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Question. What does it mean to be blessed? I know you heard this question again. You're Adventist. I'm sorry to repeat the same thing again. I know you're getting tired and boring, right? Yeah, what does it mean blessed? I tell you. You know already. It means to be happy. How many of you, you want to be happy? We do have some people that don't want to be happy. Okay, come see me afterward, okay? All right. But we all want to be happy. So Jesus is saying, here are the secrets to be happy. But I want to suggest tonight, here are the ways how we can get hot on fire. Let's find out. By the way, you know how to count, yes? You're Asians. Tell me how many times the word blessed is mentioned. Go ahead, count. Don't look at my face. Count. How many times the word blessed is mentioned? And the correct answer is nine. Very good. All right. But how many categories are there in terms of type of blessings? How many categories? There are eight categories. Why do I say that? Because the ninth time the word blessed is used, that is in connection to persecution, yes or no? So it's part of the eighth, yes? Okay, so there are eight types of blessings. Okay, now let me ask you, which blessing do you like the best? Which one you like to have? Which one? Go ahead, you can speak out. Uh, bless of the morn. Okay, good, good. Okay, anyone else? Okay, that's the result. But which blessing? Pure in heart. Okay. Peacemaker. That's good one. That's good one. You know, it's very interesting. I ask the same question to other places, and people usually say, "Pure in heart, meek, uh, mourn, P 
peacemaker, but no one says persecuted. No one says, you know what, I'm so depressed. I am so unhappy. I, need, I want to be happy. I really need some persecution. No one says that. Have you said that last time? Have you said that before? <laughs> How many are being persecuted right now? Don't raise your hands. Let me prove to you out of eight blessings, the best one is number eight. How do I know? It's not my opinion. The reason why I say that is because the word blessed is used twice. Yes or no? I know I might be stretching it. Okay, theologians, okay. But the word blessed is used twice. So I like to say it's a double blessing. But not only that, not only that, not only that. Actually, it's more than twice. Because look with me. Verse 12. Verse 12 is still part of that persecution topic. Yes or no? Yeah? Okay. So verse 12 begins with, re what? Joy and be exceeding glad. So look at this. For those who are persecuted, Jesus says, bless you. But that's not enough. Jesus says the word bless again, bless you. But that's not enough. Jesus says, rejoice. And that's not enough. Jesus says, be exceeding glad. Show me a face that you are just one time blessed. Give me some facial expression. Don't be like those sour lemon SDA people, okay? You know, I, I keep Sabbath. I drank my carrot juice this morning. <laughs> Don't look like that, okay? Have some smiles on your face, okay? So give me, give me a face that says you're blessed one time. Very good. Now show me you're double blessed. Okay, okay, okay. Now show me you're rejoicing. Okay, now show me you're exceedingly glad. Okay, now no, don't jump up and down. This is not a Pentecostal church, okay? But you got my point, yes or no? Are you getting my point clearly? Not my opinion, right? Look at the words of Jesus. Jesus put the greatest emphasis on persecution, yes or no? In the Bible, persecution often is described as fire. Yes or no? Yes? Fire. The topic for tonight, you got fire? <laughs> I'm not saying, oh man, pastor is suggesting me to look for persecution. Don't do that. Let's find out why Jesus uh, put so much emphasis to persecution. Why? Okay. And for those who are into musical language, I like to say crescendo for persecuted ones. Blessed, blessed, rejoice. Be exceeding glad. You, you with me? It's like, whoa, why? And that's number eight. I thought number seven is the favorite number in the Bible. Why number eight? Seven should be good enough, yes? Do you ever ask these kind of questions when you read the Bible? We just read, kind of read. Like, you know, your, your mind is like in a halfway coma. You know, just bless are the morning spirit, bless are the meek, and bless are the, okay, it sounds good. Just reading it, I feel blessed, even though I have no idea what it's talking about. Do you read the Bible like that? If you do, shame on you. Yeah, don't read the Bible like that. You read just like the monks. Just read, and they don't even know what they're reading. Yeah? Don't be those kind of Seventh-day Adventists. 
Okay, then you become ceremonial to just traditional and you look sour, you look boring, and you don't attract anybody to Jesus. Okay, you really have to dig deep to let the, the, the light, the understanding penetrate into your heart and begins to change your fiber, your, your, your nerve, your, your, your mental, your, your personality, and it shines that when people look at you, they say, you are blessed. Amen? Okay. So, let's ask some other questions. Okay. You know, though, every blessing has a promise, yes? Or are they all the same? Yes or no? The answer is no and yes. Okay. Uh, there, there are two blessings. The promise is exactly the same. What you want? And don't look at me. Come on, look at the Bible. If you look at me, I get nervous. Look at the Bible. Okay, which blessings are the promise part? Is exactly the same. Which one? Yeah, exactly. So, the blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of heaven. And then the, the last one, blessed are they that are persecuted, for there is, for righteousness sake, for there is kingdom of, kingdom of heaven, right? No, wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Think. Don't just read. Think. Okay. Maybe you eat too much veggie links that you cannot really think in your brain. Yeah, you're filled with carb and the oily stuff, all the fatty stuff, all the sugar. You're like, you know, like, cannot think. Do some exercise, okay? Think, why is that the promise of the kingdom of heaven is mentioned twice? And why is it that it's the first one and the last one? Jesus ran out of things to say. Jesus said, oh, I don't know what to say now. I'll just repeat what I said first. Why? <sighs> Maybe you look at me like, oh, you ask too many questions. Yeah, I don't care. I love asking questions. So why? Twice. This, the poor in spirit? A little while. A little while? <laughs> okay. Okay. Good, good observation. Yeah, you're exactly right. This is the way I see it. Again, I don't want to be so dogmatic, but you observe with me, okay? If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But this is the way I see it. The first one is actually an introduction for the whole thing. Meaning, you start with pour in spirit, but you end with kingdom of heaven. Meaning, that's, that's an introduction. So basically it goes like this. If, you're, if you have pour in spirit, that will lead you to mourn. Those who mourn, that will help you to become meek. If you are meek, you will hunger and thirst for righteousness. And when you are thirst and when you are filled with righteousness, you can be merciful. And when you are merciful, you have pure in heart. And when you have pure in heart, you can be peacemaker. And when you are peacemaker, you are ready to be persecuted. And when you are persecuted for righteousness sake, there is kingdom of heaven. It's a progression. Are you listening? It's not like, it's not like a menu. You go to a Chinese restaurant, there's a menu, you can pick and choose. Like some churches, oh, we just want the second commandment. No, some churches, they just want the first commandment and the fifth commandment. And 
seventh or eighth commandment, but not the fourth. It's not like that. Some churches, they do that. We, we don't do that. <laughs> you know, it's not a buffet. It's not a restaurant. You have to eat everything. <laughs> yeah, just like when you go to an Indian house, right? You have to eat everything. <laughs> yeah, and they keep giving you. You took one, one spoon, they give you like three spoons. You look very hungry, right? <laughs> they give you a lot more. So you have to eat everything. Just like Jesus said, this is not an option. It's like this is the way it is. It's a progression. Okay? Let me show you another reason why I believe this is progression. You ready? Okay. Uh, in those eight blessings, the word righteousness is mentioned twice. Where and where? Look. Verse 6 and verse 10. Very good. Okay. And verse 6 is what number blessing? Number 4. And verse 10 is what number blessing? 8. Exactly half and half. Coincidence? Interesting. And why is it mentioned twice? Okay, the first time. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are they that persecuted for righteousness sake. About the same? Or, or do you see any difference? What's the difference? Huh? Can I hug you? You're exactly right. The first one, you are hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Meaning, you don't have it. You are wanting it. But when you're persecuted for righteousness sake, that means you have it. So ladies and gentlemen, eight blessings is a progression of what? Receiving righteousness. It makes perfect sense. Watch. You come how? Pour in spirit because you are sinner. Yes or no? And you mourn because you're sin, your guilt. Yeah, exactly. And you become, because you're, you, you recognize you are guilty, you are going to be, you should be Meek, humble. And when you're humble, you now ready to receive. Receive what? Hunger and thirst after righteousness. So first four blessings, how to receive righteousness. Are you following? And then it says, for they shall be filled. Yeah? For they shall be filled. And when you are filled, then you're able to be merciful, meaning you can forgive. Yes or no? You, you cannot forgive unless you receive his righteousness. So, so forgiving, is, a, is that an act of righteousness? Yes or no? Okay. And then when you have a pure heart, is that a condition of righteousness? Okay. Being a peacemaker is not the title of righteous people. And then when you're persecuted for righteousness sake, that means you are righteous. Yes or no? There you go. So first four, how to receive righteousness. Last four, how to live in righteousness. Are you following? Are you enjoying how it is written in the Bible? Okay. Should we stop here? Should we continue? Okay. First four, because it is how to receive righteousness, listen, we call that justification. The last four is how to live in righteousness, we call that sanctification. 
If you want to be blessed, you should experience justification and sanctification together. Amen? Is it getting clear now? Okay. When you look at the eight blessings, you start, you start how? Pour in spirit. But then when you look at the seventh blessing, blessed are the peacemaker, for they shall be called the what? Children of what? God. That means you're complete. You are children of God now, right? You come poor, but now you become, or now you are, a child of God. And that child of God aspect is mentioned, what number blessing? Seven. In the Bible, seven means what? Complete. Yes? So we're done. Yes or no? We're children of God. We're done. We should tell God, God, give us a discount. We don't want eight. Seven is a good number. Right? We're done. Number seven is finished. Complete. Then why do we have to have number eight? Number eight is, notice the language, notice the language, and verse 11, bless are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name, sake. Now, stop right there, listen. <clears throat> I know people can, they can say all manners of evil against you and, you know, and falsely and accuse you and persecute you anytime, right? But in the life of Jesus, was there a particular moment, particular moment in the life of Jesus, he was like persecuted at the same time falsely accused and spoken evil against him. When was that? Crucifixion. Before the crucifixion, he had to go through what process? Huh? Trial. Okay. As Jesus had to go through that trial period before his crucifixion, uh, may I suggest, we also need to go through, the, through a trial period. Why do I say this? It's because, verse 12, Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your what? Reward. What's the, for great is your what? Reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So in verse 12, what word is mentioned in verse 12? That is not mentioned in verse 11 and 10. Persecuted is mentioned in verse 10. What word is mentioned, sorry, what word is new in verse 12 is not mentioned in verse 11 and 10. Reward. Question to you. Usually a reward is given after... After race, after you win something, after the Bible says, I come quickly, my reward is with me. That means what already took place before. Judgment. Judgment. So why do we have bless our day that are persecuted? Listen, God allows persecutions to judge us to see if we are truly 
blessed. Let us think. Think deep. That's the way God judges us. If you're truly blessed or not. Let's work, let's, let's work backward. Okay? It goes something like this. Now we know that we are facing great challenge in the last days. Yes? Do you feel like the last days is like just round the corner or like far away? Round the corner? Good. I think, yes. Yeah, I, I believe that's so. I think the, the current pope is also thinking that way. <laughs> He's really busy these days. He's really busy these days talking to evangelicals and other Protestants and, you know, they're trying to hang out again. You know, back to the homeboy style. Excuse my uh, breakdancing language here. Okay, and he's really you know, busy doing the, you know, bringing things together, right? So, uh, so you should not be behind. Don't be dumber than, uh, well, I should not use that word. Uh, don't be so naive. So that means, <laughs> what is the future for us? Persecution. <sighs> it's like, oh, why are we this? You know, why are we this kind of Seventh Day Adventist, and we are the remnant? It's like I'm so happy to be a remnant. Yeah, you're the one that would be persecuted. <laughs> the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. It's like. Why do, we need, why do we need this? God, you, we come to you poor in spirit and we mourn because of our sin and we humble ourselves and we become meek and we are hungry and thirsting after righteousness and we learn to forgive and we learn to have a pure heart. We become peacemakers and you call us children of God. At that point, take us to heaven. Take us to heaven. I know there's no secret rapture, but make it happen. <laughs> Come on. That's how you feel, yes or no? Don't be like, no, I'm, I'm a strong Seventh-day Adventist. I'm ready for persecution. Come on. Bring the fire. It's not hot enough. I'm going to sing the song, A Mighty Fortress. As I'm burning. Is that what you guys are like imagining? No, my friends. Listen. How many of you, from the bottom of your heart, you know, you're not ready to be persecuted? Yes. But the secret is this. In order to be prepared to be persecuted, you got to be a peacemaker first. If you are not a peacemaker and persecution comes, that persecution will cause you to become persecutor. If persecution causes you to become persecutor, that persecution is no blessing to you. It's just a method of Satan to reveal who you are inside all this time. So, true preparation for persecution is really peacemaker. And you're like, yes, I'm good. I need to be a good peacemaker. So let me try to be a peacemaker in my church. Why so many churches are fighting? Why so many people are fighting in the church, in the, the board meeting, and, and uh, this elder, that elder, I'm going to be a peacemaker. But guess what? You are not qualified to be a peacemaker if you don't have a pure in heart. If you try to be a peacemaker and not have a pure in heart, guess what? You create more division. Before it was only two people. Later on, two churches. Are you with me? Yeah. I can say this because I'm Korean. I know Korean churches. 
You're like, oh, so many Korean churches, so many Korean churches. Yeah, they all fought. Now, I don't, know about the, I don't know about the Indians or other races, but Koreans sometimes fist fight. You know, pick up chairs. They pick up chairs for the cause of God. <laughs> I kill you because my idea for God is better. True or not? I think I see some Koreans here, yeah? It's true. So you are not really prepared to be a peacemaker <laughs> if you don't have a pure in heart. And you're like, okay, I gotta have a pure in heart. How do you have pure in heart? You gotta be merciful, meaning forgiving. Some people are thinking, I'm gonna achieve pure in heart. How? I'm just going to meditate, pray, read the Bible. How? I'm just gonna eat pure food. How? I'm just going to live in a pure environment. How? I'm just going to just dress and do everything pure and perfect and clean. And nothing, just everything right. So perfect, so pure. But somewhere in that person's heart, holding a tiny grudge because the way he or she was treated by other church member. You with me? And that, that unforgiving spirit, outside, you can do like so holy and pure, but inside, you're still not letting it go. You want to prove yourself against that person. How do you prove yourself against that person? Well, you're going to like make more money or drive a better car? No. You prove to that person by becoming more spiritual. We have more Bible program. We do more Bible events. Are you with me? We are more pure. But really, in the heart, there's no forgiving spirit. No mercy. There's a raging war that you cannot have pure in heart. And you're like, okay, I gotta forgive. Okay, I'm going to forgive. I forgive you. Just don't do it again. If you don't, if you do it again, I'll kill you. Yeah, you're laughing because that's you. <laughs> yeah, that's true, yes? It's true. That's not forgiving. You know what forgiveness is? I forgive you as though you have not done it to me. Do you understand? I forgive you as though you have not done it to me. You have done it to Jesus. Because he forgives, I just go along with him. That's forgiveness. You cannot. If you always trying to, okay, I gotta make my emotions and my thoughts and my psych- psychology, my my heart to really, you know, make it so that I have the feelings of forgiveness. Uh, you're waiting until you die. <laughs> and don't even try, you know, the ceremonial forgiveness. I I forgive you. You know, there's no heart. No. True forgiveness, I don't want to forgive you. I cannot forgive you. But the only way I can forgive you, I have to accept that because Jesus forgives you, I forgive you. So it's not you, it's Jesus. And you're like, okay, How can I do that then? How can I really do that kind of forgiveness? Do you hunger and thirst after righteousness? Meaning, righteousness is not just right doing. Some people think, yeah, I hunger and thirst for righteousness. I want everything to be right. You know, 
there's a big difference between I want everything to be right and I really want to have a surrendered life to the one that is righteous. If you want to do everything right, I think you may have some muscle problem right here. Because you're clenching your teeth too tight. And you may have some constipation. Because you have to be right all the time. The way to be right is really in meekness. And meekness means humility. Humility means confession of I am nothing. I think many Seventh-day Adventists, many of us, we make great mistakes here. So how do we become like that humble? You got to mourn. Mourn? Yeah. Cry? Yes. But maybe not with tears, but, you know, really have this personal, sad feeling like you're grieving, you're, you're mourning over what? Your sin. How many of you had that kind of experience? Because of your own sin, you felt crushed. You felt like, oh man, I really need help. I'm a terrible person. Have you had that experience? Or you forgot? Too long time ago? Baptism was 20 years ago. You graduate from Revelation Daniel Seminar. You forgot? Shame on us. You know why we're not so humble? We never was like really broken. You know why we, and, and why we don't mourn? It's because we don't really understand how poor in spirit we are. We forget. How do we forget? <laughs> you know. Living the American dream, busy working, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, buying everything, but you're completely in debt. American dream is borrowed. Right? But to keep up the, the, the bills, you know, mortgage, car payment, insurance, you know, whatever, education, food, automobile. We're so busy surviving, we do not know how to recognize true condition of life. Laodicean, their biggest problem, you do not know. Poor in spirit, you know what it is? You know what it is? I clearly see who I am. It's like somebody grabbed our clothes and bam, took our clothes off. Complete shame. You see yourself in complete shame. Broken spirit. And even though you can, be, even though you can get baptized just because you don't eat pork and no smoking and give tithe, but for someone to really recognize who they are before God, it can take a long time. Why? Because God wants to delay? No, because all of us, we are hard-headed, egotistic, proud. We love our own accomplishments. I finished my Bible three times this year. I have a superintendent for five years. I'm an elder of this church. I give the most tithe. I built this church. We're all like always reminding ourselves of these accomplishments. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We forget how broken we are. And we slowly begin not to know who we are. When we do not know who we are, we stop walking in the avenue of blessings. And we don't grow. The avenue of blessings, we have to go through that experience again, again, again. What is it? Broken. Mourn, meek, hunger, forgive. P. 
pure heart peacemaker. Broken spirit, mourn, make, hunger, forgive. Pure heart peacemaker. You understand? We have to go through that avenue again, 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 until the blessings of God, the happiness and the peace, the power of God, it is intricately, like, it is, like, intimately joined together with the very fiber of our intention and our thought and our motivation. It's like, became part of us. So that our decision, our speech, our action is all motivated by this truth. Not based on any self or ego or nothing like that. It's just pure truth. But in order for us to go through that cycle, we have to always recognize who we are. But the biggest problem with the Laodicean, you do not know. So then what God does? He uses persecution to judge us, and he uses persecution to wake us up. And that persecution comes in all all different kinds and forms and shapes. Different person. But the worst one? comes within the church more painful. And when you're going through that pain, your biggest thought at that time is, whoever gave me this pain, I'm going to show them. But when you say this, you don't say it like, you know, you want to revenge. You say it like, I know I am more spiritual. And let me tell you something. <laughs> when you look at the eight blessings, right in the middle, blessed are they that hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they shall be filled. And the next point is, blessed are they that are merciful, for they shall obtain. Do, did you know? Many people are stuck right there. So they cannot continue into sanctification. They're stuck right there. Uh, meaning... <laughs> Yeah, they do recognize their own need. I need God. Oh, yeah, God, please forgive me. Mourn. Lord, I'm nothing. Oh, hunger and thirst. Yes, I need to know the Bible. I study the Bible. I pray, God, give me your righteousness. Forgive me. Give me assurance. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And God says, forgive. And we like... I do forgive them. And God says again, forgive. I already forgiven them. Then why can't you go visit them? You're, you, the way you forgive, I forgive and we don't have anything to do with it anymore. That's them. So somehow, you, you know, you, if you meet them during camp meeting, it's kind of awkward. Oh, hi, happy Sabbath. Hi. We haven't seen each other for a long time, huh? Even though we live so close to each other. So we're stuck right there. Never make that progression. So let me ask you something again. Do you want to be blessed? You know what Jesus said? After the eight blessings, verse 13, Jesus said, Ye are the what? Salt. 
And then verse 14, he says, you are the what? Light. Look at this. Listen. You are the salt. What is salt? It gives flavor, yes? But when it is giving us flavor, when it is working, can you see it or not? Cannot see. Invisible. So when salt is doing its job, you cannot see it. You can only taste it. Fire. You're the light. Candle. When it is doing its work, you can see. But both have something, something similar. Salt, invisible. Light, visible. But both have something similar. You know what it is? Salt. It has to give up, melt away, to do its work. The salt, hard salt, has to be melted away. And light, it has to burn away. Both has self-sacrifice. Christian life should be based on self-sacrifice. And then people will be able to taste and see that God has blessed you. So you want to be a salt and light? Very simple. Be blessed. It's in connection. Everything is connected. When you walk in the sanctuary, you bring a sacrifice. And when you bring a sacrifice, that represents broken in spirit. Bring it to the altar, and you kill it with, your, with a knife. When you do that, you mourn for your sin. And you become meek. Spiritually, you go right in, spiritually, into the sanctuary. When you walk in, you have showbread. Showbread is something that you eat. You hunger and thirst after righteousness. Are you listening? And then, when you're filled, you can be merciful, yeah? And those who are merciful, they shall obtain mercy. They're going right into the mercy seat. And when you're in mercy seat, when you're practicing mercy, you are, you have the character of God. And when you have the character of God, you have pure in heart. You shall see God. Shekinah glory. Amen. And when you're in the most holy place, you're participating in the day of atonement. Atonement. At one mint. At one mint, meaning bringing things together as one. Peace maker. And during that time, you'll be judged. So are you truly blessed? Meaning, when you are persecuted, can you remain as a peacemaker? When you are persecuted, can you remain in pure in heart? When you are persecuted, can you still forgive them? Just like Jesus forgave. When you are persecuted, can you still thirst and, and hunger after righteousness for God and not for the things of the world? And when you're persecuted, can you stay humble and be meek? When you're persecuted, can you cry more for your sin? Not just because of the pain that the people may afflict you with. And, you, and when people are persecuting you, can you still remain Poor in spirit, crying out, your greatest need is not so much the deliverance from this persecution. Your greatest need is God's presence in my life. And when you are completely embedded in the solid blessings of God, then you're ready to be persecuted. So now, how many of you, you truly want to be blessed? Jacob, on the way back home, he heard his brothers coming. 
his feeling, his brother is coming to kill him. Oh, that's a mental stress. Yes or no? How would you like to get a phone call? Someone, hey, I hate you. I'm coming to kill you. Bye. Can you eat your curry rice and be able to digest it? No. Can you imagine the mental anguish? And then, that's only mental. What about social? Uh, he had to like, go this way, go that way. He's all by himself. Isolated, alone. Mental, so mentally, he's stressed. Socially, he's all by himself. You understand? And then in the process of wrestling with that angel, the angel pulled his leg out. Have you had your leg out? Can you imagine how painful? So physically painful, mentally stressed, socially isolated, lonely. On top of that, spiritually, the angel, is his body language, let me go. Let me go. So it's like God is rejecting him. Spiritually broken, physically broken, mentally broken, socially broken. He's all by himself. But there's one thing. There's one thing he knew. God. He loves to bless in righteousness, in truth. As long as Jacob is humble, as, he, as long as he's surrendering his life to God, he knows he will be blessed. That's why Jacob said, I cannot let you go. What, what, what caused him to say, I cannot let you go? Because all the good things that he had done? No. He can say, I cannot let you go because I know I experienced the blessings of God. I confess my sins. I surrender my life to you. I know I have tasted and have seen the goodness of God. I know. I know you bless me. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. I cannot let you go unless you bless me. That's Jacob. And the angel said, you're no longer Jacob. Now, you're Israel. Which means overcomer. When you study seven churches, he that overcometh, 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 Israel! How do you overcome? Completely surrender and allow the thoughts and the feelings of God's truth and his blessings to take control of every fiber of your soul so that nothing can shake you. So that you can easily detect your ego. You're like, oh, yep, that's my ego. That person is being mean, but oh, I'm about to respond oh, in, a, in a very mean way, but oh, I don't have to do that. I can choose to be like Jesus. Change. Oh, my wife is irritating me because she keeps repeating the same thing over and over again. Oh, I don't have to respond that way. If I do, I'm going to go back to the way we used to live. So I'm going to respond the way Jesus did. Yes? Oh, what do you want in your life? Aren't you sick and tired of living a Christian life, going through the church motion, but you're not growing? We can change that tonight, amen? How is it possible? Start walking through the avenue of blessings. How do you start? Very simple. Do you feel the need? When 
you feel the need, sit down and figure out exactly what your need is. And discover who you are and to discover who God is. Start from there and walk through. And God will bless you. My final thought. Job, according to Jesus, in a short word, he was a blessed man, yes? Yes? And Satan says, he's only acting that way because you're blessing him. God says, no, he is truly blessed inside. Satan says, no. If you take away his materials, he will curse you to your face. And God says, okay, let's have showdown. I'll give you permission. Do whatever you want. Let's see how we respond. That's a part of great controversy. So who want to be part of this great controversy? And to win it. My brothers and sisters, May the Lord bless you tonight. And when you come back tomorrow morning, let us all come with meek and humble spirit to embrace the word completely. What do you say? Amen. Amen. God bless you. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the blessings and the enlightenment and the light of God shining into our dark hearts, that we may understand who we are and to understand who you are, that we may be transformed into the glory of God. We recognize our weaknesses and our our imperfections, but we are not afraid because Jesus is on our side as we surrender our life to you completely. We know that you, who has begun a good work, will finish it. So may we continue to look to you for that glory, for that beauty. So transform us, we pray. Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen.